Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. President Biden signed the Respect for Marriage Act into law Tuesday, enshrining federal protections for same-sex and interracial marriages. Biden spoke at the celebratory event, which featured musical performers in a White House illuminated in rainbow colors. Racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, they're all connected. But the antidote to hate is love. The new law would not prevent states from banning same-sex marriage if the conservative-led Supreme Court overturns Obergefell v. Hodges, but it would force those states to recognize marriages from another state. It also repeals the 1996 Defense of Marriage Act. Among the speakers at the White House ceremony were Gina and Heidi Norton-Smith, plaintiffs in the lawsuit that led to marriage equality in Massachusetts. This is Heidi Norton-Smith. It takes the efforts of many to bend the arc of history toward justice. Even now, there are so many places where people in our community are under attack. The work will continue, but look at how far we've come. In Iran, at least 400 people have been sentenced to up to 10 years in prison for their involvement in anti-government protests, this according to officials. Human rights groups say over 14,000 people have been arrested across Iran since mobilizations began in mid-September, sparked by the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in the custody of the so-called morality police. Meanwhile, 26-year-old Iranian soccer player Amir Nasser Azadani has reportedly been sentenced to death for his involvement in the protests. At least two protesters have already been executed. The U.N. warns Somalia could be facing famine within months, while as many as half a million children under the age of five could die by mid-2023. Hunger has already claimed many lives, with 200,000 people facing catastrophic food shortages due to a protracted drought, rising food costs and violent insurgent attacks. Three million people have been displaced. Some analysts say Somalia is already experiencing famine and are urging an official declaration to help garner urgently needed aid and attention. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, at least 120 people have been killed, dozens of others injured by floods and landslides caused by torrential rains in the capital, Kinshasa. Major roads were submerged and muddy water are destroyed by sinkholes while homes collapsed. Rescue efforts to find survivors continue. Local residents place blame on government neglect. We have elected a government that is unable to give its people what they need. This road has been in threat of collapse for a long time. We have alerted the authorities to this situation, but here is the pure reality. It's really difficult for them to even build a gutter. In South Africa, lawmakers have voted against impeaching President Cyril Ramaphosa over a report that says he hid undeclared stolen money at his game farm. The report prompted calls by opponents for Ramaphosa to resign, but lawmakers from the ruling African National Congress Party mostly supported the president in their vote. It comes as Ramaphosa will seek re-election as leader of the ANC at its national conference starting Friday. A new UNICEF report finds over 11,000 children have been killed or injured in the U.S.-backed Saudi-led war in Yemen since 2015. A six-month ceasefire between warring parties expired in October. Meanwhile, U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders withdrew an expected vote on his Yemen War Powers Resolution Tuesday evening, saying he's in talks with the Biden administration. Sanders said he would bring the resolution back if they could not reach an agreement on ending U.S. support for the war. In Ukraine, officials say their air defenses shot down 13 Russian drones earlier today, targeting the capital, Kyiv. Meanwhile, the U.S. is reportedly finalizing plans to send its long-range Patriot air defense system to Ukraine. The eastern city of Bakhmut has been nearly decimated, as Russian forces have continued to ramp up its attacks. This is a 70-year-old resident who this week decided to flee her hometown after months of intense shelling. I did not think that the situation in Bakhmut would go this far. I thought it would not be that terrifying, and I could not imagine that the whole city would be destroyed. A French court convicted eight people over the 2016 terror attack in Nice when a man plowed a truck through a crowd celebrating Bastille Day, killing 86 people, injuring hundreds. The driver, Mohamed Louaj Boulel, was shot dead on the scene by police. The other men convicted Tuesday for helping the mass killer receive prison terms ranging from two to 18 years. 
Another boat carrying dozens of asylum seekers is capsized in the English Channel, with reports early today of at least four people dead in the freezing temperatures and icy waters. At least 40 asylum seekers have been rescued so far, as U.K. and French authorities continue search efforts. The tragedy comes a day after the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak vowed to enact even harsher policies to block asylum seekers from entering Britain through the Channel. New Zealand passed the world's first lifetime tobacco ban, barring anyone born after 2008 from ever buying cigarettes and dramatically reducing the availability of tobacco. The percentage of the population that cannot buy tobacco will increase each year with the goal of a smoke-free future. This is Associate Health Minister Aisha Virol. There is no good reason to allow a product to be sold that kills half the people that use it. That's right. And I can tell you that we will end this in the future as we pass this legislation. Back in the United States, outgoing Oregon Democratic Governor Kate Brown has commuted the sentences of all 17 people on death row to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Governor Brown called the death penalty dysfunctional and immoral. In Kentucky, the city of Louisville has agreed to pay $2 million to settle two lawsuits filed by Kenneth Walker, the boyfriend of Breonna Taylor, who was shot and killed in her own home during a 2020 police raid. Walker was with Taylor the night of the fatal shooting and fired a shot at police as they burst into Taylor's home while serving a no-knock warrant. Walker had said the officers never identified themselves before entering the home and never attempted to save Breonna Taylor as she lay dying after she was struck by a of gunfire. Charges against Walker, including attempted murder of a police officer, have been dropped. In Dimmick, Pennsylvania, residents expressed outrage after the Department of Environmental Protection lifted its drilling moratorium on Cotera Energy just weeks after the fracking company pleaded no contest to polluting the community's water. Cotera, formerly known as Cabot Oil and Gas, also agreed to pay $16 million to build a new public water system and pay local water bills for 75 years. Food and Water Watch said allowing Cotera to drill again is an unconscionable betrayal of suffering communities and urged incoming Governor Josh Shapiro to undo the deal when he takes office. Scientists and U.S. officials have hailed a major milestone in nuclear fusion technology, igniting the hopes of breakthrough could lead to a clean energy future. Researchers at California's Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory last week successfully achieved net energy gain through fusion ignition, generating more power than is used to create the reaction. Unlike fission, which is currently used by nuclear power plants, fusion does not produce long-lasting nuclear waste or carbon emissions. However, scientists say it'll likely be decades before the technology is perfected enough to begin producing energy at scale. The experiment's likely to more immediately benefit the U.S. military and its nuclear weapons arsenal. This is Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm. Simply put, this is one of the most impressive scientific feats of the 21st century. This milestone moves us one significant step closer to the possibility of zero carbon, abundant fusion energy powering our society. And today marks 10 years since the 2012 Sandy Hook massacre, which claimed the lives of 20 school children and six educators. The children would have been high school juniors today. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman.